welcome to part three of our How to Play Walking Dead Call to Arms video series. Back in our first video, if you remember, we built our 300 point team. And then in our second video, we went through the first phase of a real game turn, which was the strategy phase. And we rolled and we scored three strategy points. So now we're in the second phase of a game turn, which is where we're really going to begin to play the game. This is going to be the action phase. So this is where we do all of our important maneuvering, moving, shooting, fighting, special actions, reloading weapons, scavenging supplies, scoring victory points, all that stuff where we really start to play the game, this is where it happens and this is where we're going to learn about it. So this is going to be a longer video. So because of that, we're going to have timestamps down in the description and you can go down and click on any of those and you can go straight to the moving section, straight to the shooting section straight to learning how to scavenge for victory points or how to handle melee combat. Any of that stuff that you want to do, you can jump straight to those points or you can watch it all the way through and get an overall, an overall idea of how to handle all of the action phase. During your turn in the action phase, you can do any two of these actions, but you can't do the same one twice. So you can't move twice, you can't shoot twice, you can't engage two different melees, unless you have some kind of special rule or you're granted a free action or something like that. Um, but those are special rules that we can cover later on. But for right now, let's just say that you can only perform two actions and you can't do the same one twice. Alright, so we've done enough talking. Let's go down to the table and I'll show you what we have set up. Alright, so for anyone just joining us here uh, in video three, instead of going back and watching the first two, this is where we're going to start at. So this is our 300 point army that we built. This is the Woodbury Army faction that you're going to get if you buy the starter box and the three green uh, tokens up there over top of the governor are three strategy points that we rolled for and accumulated in video two. Alright so here we are going to have our table set up. This is going to be a two by four table we have our team over there deployed on the far side and we've got a couple walkers and some supply counters out there on the table as well. Alright, so the first thing we're going to start out with with our actions is moving. Now, in the Walking Dead All Out War, there are two essential types of movement that you can do. One is a sneak and one is a run. And we're going to measure these using these measuring sticks that come with the Walking Dead All Out War. Uh, and you can get these in either the starter set for All Out War or in the Prelude to Woodbury solo starter set for that game. Now you don't need these, they're really convenient because they have 4 and 8 inches marked off on them. Uh, but you can use a measuring tape if you'd rather do that as well. You don't have to move the full 4 or the, four, the full 8, uh, but those are the maximums that you can do. So we just measure that from the front of the base to the front of the base. And if we want to move Bruce 4, we'll just do that. Or if we want to move Bruce to full 8, we can do that as well. But if we move 8 inches, that's going to create noise. And I'll explain what noise does. So once you make an 8 inch move, the noise that it creates as you're running, the footsteps, you're huffing and puffing, you're crashing around getting it wherever you need to go, it's going to create noise. And that noise is going to draw in the closest walker within... 10 inches of you and that walker is going to do what's called a shamble movement up to 6 inches in a straight line. So in this case the walker that is directly in front of Bruce is now going to make a 6 inch move towards him and when she makes contact with him that's going to engage Bruce. And you can see that my measuring stick switched over to red and that's the convenient thing about those is that one side has the survivor movement on it marked off as four or eight inches and then the opposite side of that has the walker movement marked off on that and they can move six inches. So for now Bruce has made his movement he's drawn that walker into him he still has one action that he can take but he's engaged with that walker. Okay so let's take Bruce back to where he started at and let's pretend that there's this barrier in between him and where he wants to finish his run at. Now he can still attempt to go and do an 8 inch run but he's going to have to do some extra work to get over there. So what he's going to have to do in order to complete his move now is roll the 50-50 die. 
and we can have either the star side or the blank side. Now on the star he's going to be able to complete his move and successfully hurdle or climb over, slide across the hood of a car, whatever kind of action-packed move he wants to do he's going to clear the piece of terrain that he's trying to get over top of and on a blank he's going to fail. He's going to stumble, fall, whatever. He's not going to complete his move and he's going to have to stop on the side he started on. So if he were to make his 8 inch run, he's still going to clear that piece of terrain, be able to make his full 8 inch move, and then again the noise is going to attract that closest walker within 10 inches of him and move in that 6 inch direct line towards him. So that female walker is still going to come in and make her way over to him. If he were to attempt to make that 8 inch move and he rolls a blank on that 50-50 die, he's going to have to stop short on that side of the barrier. Alright, so the last thing to consider with movement before we go into the next action is going to be if you're going to start a move through area terrain. So if Bruce wants to make a move and he's going to go through something like these trees over here, as soon as his movement hits the, the boundary of the terrain, the remainder of it is going to be halved. So let's say he makes a four inch move through the terrain, he only gets to move two inches. Or if he wants to run eight inches, he can only move four through the terrain. All right, so we're gonna say that Bruce has gone ahead and moved eight inches and drawn in that one walker to engage him. Now, typically we would move straight into a melee and have Bruce attack this walker. But like I said, we're gonna come back to Bruce uh, at a later point in this video. Uh, in a real game situation, we wouldn't do that. We would move both of Bruce's actions our opponent would take a turn, and then we come back to our next survivor. Alright, we're going to start talking about melee combat. Now this is going to be one of the most common types of melee combat that you're going to see in a Walking Dead game. This is going to be a survivor versus a walker. So here we have Bruce who made his move action, and now he is engaged with this walker. So we're going to use our second action to fight her in melee combat. So we're going to go over and take a look at his card, and we'll show you where his melee stat is located on there. Alright, so we look over here at Bruce's card, and if you look underneath of his equipment, we'll look for a melee weapon, and he doesn't have one. He has a M4 carbine, which is a ranged weapon, but that's okay. If you look under his melee stat, Bruce has a blue die listed there. Now, even though he doesn't have a melee weapon, he is still able to make an attack because Bruce is a bad dude and he gets to roll a blue die in melee combat. Now if he were to have some kind of equipment underneath of there, then we would add whatever that equipment said to his roll. But for now, Bruce is going to roll a blue die in melee combat. Now all of the walkers are going to attack in combat as well, and they are always going to attack with a single red die when they go to attack, as long as you're only fighting one walker. Walkers have a special outnumbering rule, which we'll cover later in the walker phase. But for right now, this walker is going to roll one red die to attack Bruce. Now, if Bruce didn't want to attack, he could choose to roll his defense. So in defense, he would roll two red against the walker's single red attack die. Now the thing with this is you have to remember, in Call to Arms, there's something called a rule of three. And what that says is you cannot roll more than three of the same colored dice. So Bruce already has two red for defense. If he were to have some kind of equipment which would give him an extra red die to his defense, that's fine. If he were to have something that would give him two red defense, then he would only be able to roll three because you can only ever roll three dice of the same color. All right, so now here, Mantic has made the rules really simple. All we're going to do is roll one blue die for Bruce, one red die for the walker, and compare the results. Whoever has more on the dice is going to win the combat. So in this scenario, Bruce rolls a 3, and the walker rolls a 1. Alright, so back out here with our combat, we put our results out. So Bruce has rolled a 3 with a critical, and the walker has rolled a 1. Now, Bruce is going to win the combat, and because he rolled the critical, that walker is going to be struck in the head 
and she is going to be removed from play. Anytime you roll a critical and win combat against a walker, that walker will be removed from play. So now there are some other possible situations that could happen in this combat. So Bruce may win combat, and let's say he rolls a 2, and again the walker rolls a 1. He's going to win the combat, but he didn't cause a critical hit. So in this instance, the walker is going to be pushed back and knocked prone. So here we've moved the walker back one inch, and we've put the prone marker down next to her. Now you can either have markers like this, you can use tokens or anything else, or you can lay the model down. Now this is a little bit more accurate when you go to stand the back up, so this is what I choose to use. So in this scenario we have Bruce and the walker both tying by rolling a 1 in combat, and here all you're going to do is a survivor will always win a tie against a walker, so here the walker is going to move back an inch, but not knocked prone. And then in this scenario here, we have the walker winning combat. Now, Bruce cannot roll a blank on that blue die. The blue die is the best die that you can roll in this game. So here, Bruce is going to be knocked back an inch. And because the walker has rolled a critical, the walker is now going to inflict a bite against Bruce. And that could cause extra wounds during the end phase of the game, which we'll cover down the line in a later video. But for this, Bruce is going to be knocked back an inch. And what you're going to want to do is either put some kind of marker down either near the model or on their character card to show that they are bitten and so that you can remind yourself to roll forward during your end phase. Alright, so here's your other type of combat that we're going to run into in Call to Arms. And this is going to be Survivor versus Survivor. So here let's say that we've had Eugene and he's made his move action and he's engaged Carl. Now, there's a couple different rules that are going to come in when you're fighting another Survivor and we'll cover them as we go through this here. We're going to start out the same way. We're going to go back to our survivor cards and look at them and figure out what dice our guys are going to roll against each other. All right, so we'll start here and look at Eugene, and we'll check his melee stat first. So we know that right away we're going to roll one white die and one red die because of his melee combat stat. And then if we look at his equipment, he's also carrying a baseball bat, so we're going to add a second red to that so he's going to roll one white and two red for his melee. And then you can see underneath it there, it says that Bruisers, and remember his character type is Bruiser, he can re-roll one red die per attack. And he's also wearing some padding here, so it says he's wearing football pads, so we're going to reduce any damage taken from melee attacks by one point. And he's also got a special rule in there, we're also in melee, if he performs a melee attack and fails to beat the target's defense roll, immediately roll a red and add it to the defense. Now that's only going to take place if the character chooses to defend. So now let's take a look at Carl's card and see what he looks like. Alright, so for Carl, I'm going to start out by saying we are using Carl's card out of the rulebook. If you have the rulebook, it has some character cards inside of there. If you want to try and just play through some dummy games to see if you like how it plays out, Go for it. You can do that without buying any extra cards if you have some minis from All Out War. Now, with Carl, you can see that he's not great um, the way he's set up for melee combat. He has a single red for melee, and he has a single red for defense. He has no equipment that's going to help him, and he doesn't really have any special rules that are going to help him here either. And his lucky hat make them into play if we can do enough wounds. Um, and if we get to that point, we can talk about that. But it basically gives Carl a 50-50 chance at whether or not he finally dies. So, remember from Eugene's card, he is going to roll two red and one white against Carl, and we're going to have Carl attempt to attack him as well. And he is going to roll a single red. All right, now normally what you would do is you would roll all of your dice at the same time as your opponent does, and then compare the results. But since we're doing it this way, I'm going to roll for Eugene first, set his to the side, and then we'll roll for Carl so we don't get anything confused. So this is going to be Eugene's white and red base with his red added in for his baseball bat. So Eugene has rolled a three. Now we'll roll for Carl. 
and Carl has rolled a 1. So now for the results, we'll take Eugene has rolled 3, Carl has rolled 1, which would mean Eugene wins, and he's going to inflict 2 points of damage against Carl. Now if you remember back to Eugene's special rule, bruisers can re-roll 1 red die because he has the baseball bat. So we may as well try and inflict extra damage and use our re-roll. So we're going to re-roll our blank red and see if we can get any more wounds. So we use our re-roll and we manage to roll 2 plus a critical, which is going to give us 5 overall total successes. But like I said, there are a couple extra rules when you're fighting against survivors. Alright, so if we come back out here and we look at the results, we can see that, again, Eugene has rolled 5 successes against Carl's single success. So now typically, Eugene would inflict four wounds because we're going to take five minus one to get four wounds against Carl. Because Eugene rolled the critical, it's going to inflict one extra wound for a total of five wounds against Carl. Now you can only ever add in one additional wound regardless of how many criticals you roll. He could have rolled three criticals, one on each of those dice, and we would have only added one extra wound had he won the combat. So we come back here and we look at Carl's character card. We can see that he only has four health points. Now, we inflicted five wounds, so Carl would be killed, and typically the character would then be laid prone and come back as a walker. Since we inflicted the critical, we caused that headshot, just like we removed the walker from play when we inflicted the headshot, Carl would also go away and not come back as a walker. So back out here, Carl will be removed from play in this scenario. If our results would have stayed this, uh, which was our original roll, and we wouldn't have rolled the critical, we would have inflicted two wounds, and Carl would have just been knocked back an inch. Now there are a few weapons in combat that can knock survivors prone, and what you'll see will be a special keyword for the weapon, which will say bludgeon. Unfortunately, Eugene's baseball bat does not have that, so here Carl will just be moved back an inch. And then finally, melee combat. We have two very different scenarios down here. We're going to have Bruce attacking a prone walker, and Carl attacking a prone survivor. Now, it doesn't matter which prone type of model you are engaging, in order to remove that model completely from play, all you have to do is beat their defense roll. Prone survivors are only able to defend themselves. So in this scenario, Carl could roll his single red attack die against Eugene's defense value. As long as he beats that, he can remove Eugene from play, even if Eugene is at full health when he gets knocked down. And then for Bruce, he doesn't have to roll the critical to remove a prone walker. He only has to beat the walker's single red die roll. So in this instance here, Carl has rolled a 2, and Eugene has rolled a 0. Now, remember, Eugene has the football pads, so it's going to reduce Carl's 2 down to a 1, but 1 is still greater than 0, and at this point, Eugene will be completely removed from play. So Carl isn't totally worthless in this scenario. With the walker, we have Bruce who has rolled a 2 without a critical against a walker who has rolled a 1. Now, remember you don't need to roll the critical, so that walker is now going to be removed from play. So let's come back to this combat here with Carl and Eugene. And if Carl goes into this knowing that he's probably not going to be able to defend himself against Eugene and his bat, and he's not going to be able to cause any wounds using just his fist because he doesn't have any melee weapons, Carl's going to elect to use his gun in the combat. Now, you can use a gun, which is typically a ranged weapon, in melee combat if it has the handgun keyword on the survivor's card. So let me show you where that is. If you look under the equipment on Carl's card, you can see it has a 22 revolver, and it says it's a ranged weapon, and at short distance, it can do one red die's worth of damage. But what we're looking for is underneath of where it says 22 revolver, the keywords say handgun and mayhem. 
any ranged weapon that has the word handgun can be used in melee combat. So now instead of just rolling a single red die, Carl can roll his shoot value even though he's in melee combat, which is also a red, but he can also add in another red to that. So he's not rolling as poorly as he would have been. So now because of that you can see that Carl has fared much better in the combat and he's only lost by one. Carl is going to get moved back an inch because he lost the combat, but then the mayhem part of the handgun is going to be applied. Now if we open the board up, melee is very similar to noise in that it, it affects a 10 inch radius of the source of the noise, which was Carl because he fired off the shot. But instead of just pulling in one single walker that moves six inches, it's going to pull in any walker within 10 inches and they're going to move in a six inch line directly towards Carl. So you can see that because the shot was fired, Carl has now been engaged by one of the walkers that was within six inches, and then the larger walker in the brown moved six inches closer towards Carl. Now just think if you can use this strategically, if there had been some walkers on the opposite side of Eugene that Carl could have then pulled into him. So sometimes, like in this scenario, if you know going in that Carl probably isn't going to make it through, and you can draw some walkers into the attacker that may potentially take you out of the game, you may as well go for it and fire off the shot. Now you may be wondering why the walker that is down there next to Bruce didn't move as well. And that's because that walker is engaged with Bruce right now. So because they're in base contact, she's not going to break contact to move towards Carl. Okay, let's talk about shooting. Now with shooting, there are three basic things that you want to consider. The first is going to be the most obvious, and that is, does my survivor have a ranged weapon. Now, this seems very obvious. Now, the easiest way to tell this is because Call to Arms uses a very what you see is what you get system, if your mini has a gun on the sculpt, then they're going to have a, a ranged weapon. If they don't have one on their sculpt and you bought one during the team building phase, then it'll be on their survivor card. So for this, we're going to use Lily, and we can see that Lily has a rifle. And then we can verify that by going to her character card and seeing what type of rifle she has and what type of dice that's going to add to our shoot roll. Now, the second thing you want to consider is can I see any eligible targets? And that's going to be called line of sight. So here we can see Lily back there and Lily has a few walkers within her line of sight. And she also has Carl, who's out there. She wanted to take a shot all the way down there at him. Now the easiest way to work your line of sight is to draw an imaginary line from any part of your base to any part of your target's base. And if you can see that, then that person is in your line of sight. Now if there is an object in between you that covers more than 50% of the target, then they're going to get a cover bonus. And we'll explain what that is here in a little bit and show you some examples of that. But for right now, we want to know, do we have a ranged weapon and is someone in line of sight? And then the last thing to consider is, if I do have a target and they're in my line of sight and I have a ranged weapon, does the weapon I'm using have the range to hit them? And there are three different range types in Call to Arms. And the easiest way to explain that is to look at the character card. So here we can look at Lily's character card we can see that she has a basic shoot value of one white die. And then under her equipment, she has a Remington 700 rifle, which is going to then add various other dice to her shoot value, depending on the range that the target is at. Now, the first range is going to be short distance. And that is going to be whatever the first set of dice are listed on the card. So. Short distance is 10 inches or less. So if Lily is shooting at a target 10 inches or less from her, she'll get her white basic shoot value and then two additional red dice added on to that. The second value is a single red die and that is going to be for a target that is at medium range. Now medium range is anything greater than 10 inches but less than 20 inches. 
if Lily is shooting at a target that is 15 inches away from her, she's going to get her white base plus a red for the Remington 700 rifle. And then you can see that the third value on there is listed as an X. Now, the third value is going to be long range. So that's anything greater than 20 inches up to 30 inches away. And if there's an X on there, it means that that weapon is incapable of firing at that range. So this means Lily's rifle can only fire up to 20 inches. So what you can do going into the, your shooting action is to know the distance of your weapon. And you can pre-measure it to see if you're willing to take that shot. Or maybe you need to make a move action before it to get yourself within range. And then you can see there are keywords underneath of the rifle itself, which is reliable, rifle, and mayhem. And we'll cover what each of them do as we go through the shooting action. So if we're out here with Lily and we decide that we want her to take a shoot action at the large walker there in between Bruce and Eugene, we can see that he is about 10 inches away from her, which puts him at short range. For her shot, she will roll her white base plus the two red because that walker is at short range. If she wanted to take a shot at Carl, who is engaged with the walker further away, Carl is at 14 inches away, which puts him at medium range. So she would roll her white base plus a single red because he's out there. Now when taking a shot at a walker, they're going to get to roll a base defense against the shot coming at them. So walkers will roll one red die in defense if they have no cover in between them and the shooter. So here, Lily's going to roll her white and two red against the walker's single red. So here we can see that Lily has rolled her dice and rolled four successes. The walker has rolled his defense, and he's rolled one success. So, again, Manti has made the rules very simple. So all we have to do is subtract, and we get three wounds that would go through to the walker. Now, because walkers don't take wounds, they can either just be knocked prone or have a headshot inflicted against them to remove them from play. All three of those shots are just going to knock that walker prone. So he gets moved an inch back and a prone marker placed next to him, or you can lay the model down to indicate they are not In this prone. scenario, Lily has rolled five successes plus one critical against the walker who has rolled one success. So in this instance, because Lily has won the combat and rolled the critical, this walker would then be removed from play. The other thing that could happen would be that Lily has the same roll, rolls five successes, plus the critical, but the walker also rolls the critical success as well. So what happens is the criticals will cancel each other out, but the successes will stay the same. So Lily has still rolled five, the walker has rolled two, so typically three wounds would go through, but all that would happen would be this walker, again, would be knocked back and prone. So let's talk about cover now. If Lily still wants to shoot at that walker, and there's a piece of cover between her and the walker, that walker is going to gain a cover bonus to add to his base defense. So in this scenario, Lily would still roll her white base and two red because she's firing an enemy within short distance, and the walker is going to get his base defense of one red die plus a cover bonus because that barricade is between the target, and Lily. So if there's one piece of cover between the shooter and their target, the target will get one red die added to their base defense. If there are two pieces of cover between the shooter and their target, the target will then get a white die added to their defense. And finally, if there are three or more pieces of cover between the target and the shooter, then the target will get a blue die added to their defense. Let's say that Lily doesn't want to shoot at that walker in front of her, and she wants to shoot at Carl instead. Let's see how that would work out. Lily has her ranged weapon, Carl is within her line of sight, and he's within range. So let's look for anything that may block her line of sight and give Carl a cover bonus. That walker that's in the brown is blocking Lily's line of sight 
to Carl. So we can see here that the walker in the middle of the board is blocking Lily's direct line of sight to Carl. So Carl is going to get a cover bonus because of that walker. Now in addition to that, because Lily is shooting into a melee combat, she has to roll the 50-50 die to see if she hits her intended target. So if you roll the badge on the 50-50 die, we're going to hit our intended target, which is Carl. However, if we roll a blank, then our opponent gets to pick what target we hit. In this case, the opponent may pick Eugene and say that Lily misses and strikes Eugene instead. So let's say, in this scenario, Lily rolls the badge, so we know we're going to shoot Carl. And we know that Carl is already going to get one red die added to his base defense because of the walker that's in between him and Lily causing cover. So now we'll look at Carl's defense and see that he's going to roll a red base plus his red bonus for the cover against Lily's shoot action. And then remember, now Lily is at medium distance, so she's only going to be rolling her white base plus her red bonus for the rifle. Okay, so here we're going to have Lily rolling her shoot attack, so she rolls her white and red, and she gets three successes. Carl rolls his base defense plus his cover bonus for two red dice, and he gets two successes. So again, to figure out how many wounds are going to be inflicted, we just subtract the defense from the attack value, and we have one wound that carries through to Carl. Here we have the defender tying the shooter's attack. Now if this happens, there are no wounds that are going to be assessed. If the defender beats the attacker, so say Lily rolls a 1 or a blank, and Carl rolls 2, Carl will still take no wounds. If Lily rolls a critical success, which is going to be the exclamation mark, that's going to be a headshot. So how that works is she's still going to roll three successes, and Carl has rolled two successes. But because she rolled the critical, it's going to add on one bonus wound, so Carl would actually take two wounds. Here we have Carl rolling a critical success as a defense. So we have Lily who has rolled three plus a critical, and Carl has rolled two and a critical. The criticals are going to cancel each other out, so we're just going to have one wound go through to Carl. So here if Lily has a great roll and she gets four successes and two criticals against Carl who has rolled two successes, we still have four against two, so two wounds are going to come through to Carl, but we can only add one bonus wound to that, regardless of the number of criticals that we roll. Let's talk about what else happens when we come up with these critical results on the shooting dice. Now in addition to adding in an extra wound, we all know that ammo is pretty scarce in the Walking Dead universe, and Call to Arms tries to take this into consideration. So if we come up with one critical success on our weapon, it means we're going to have to take an ammo check. And the way we do that is we're going to roll the 50-50 die. And if we come up with a badge, then our ammo is fine, and we can continue to shoot. However, if we roll a blank, then our weapon is going to be out of ammo, and we're going to have to use a reload action to put more ammo into it. So what you want to do, just to remind yourself, is to drop some kind of token next to your survivor to let you know that, hey, Lily can't fire her weapon until she reloads it. If you happen to roll more than one critical during your shooting attack, then that means your weapon is going to automatically run out of ammo. So if we look back here at Lily's character card, we can see that underneath of her Remington 700 rifle, it has the first word which says reliable. Now reliable is going to let you re-roll your 50-50 die if you fail your ammo check. Now that's only if you roll one critical and then fail that ammo check can you do the reliable. If you happen to roll more than one critical, you're still going to be out of ammo, regardless of if you have the reliable special roll or not. Alright, let's come over to this side of the table, and we'll see what's going on over here. So on this side we have Wes standing next to Gabe. Now Wes has a assault rifle, as opposed to Lily, who we just looked at, who had a rifle. Now, if you have a machine gun, you're going to want to fire more than one shot, right? Because that's what a machine gun does. It lays down a lot of fire. 
So let's look at Wes's character card and see if he's got any different rules for his gun. All right, so here we look at Wes's character card and we see that he has a red base shoot value. Then we look at his equipment and we see he starts out the game with an M4 carbine, which short range is going to add in a white die, at medium range an additional red, and he cannot fire it at ranges all longer than 20 inches. Uh, and then underneath of that, you see where it says multiple shots, two. Now what that's going to mean is that we can make two shots in the same action. And they're each going to be rolled for individually. And then he also has the keyword reliable, which you remember from our previous shot, allow us to re-roll our ammo check if we come up with a critical. So we come back at her to the table, and we can see that both of these walkers are within 10 inches of Wes. So Wes is going to be gaining an additional white die to his red base die for his shooting value. So when we talk about multiple shots, we're going to pick an original target. We can then continue to shoot at the same target multiple times, or we can choose a different target within the kill zone of the original target and take a shot at them. So for this one, if we want to shoot at the walker near the driver's side door of the police car, we can take one shot at him, and then we can place the kill zone over top of him, and we can see that the walker at the front of the car is also underneath of the kill zone, so we can then take an additional shot at her if we want to. So here we can see that Wes has rolled three successes, and the walker has rolled one success. In addition, Wes also rolled the critical, which would then eliminate the walker. So the first walker is removed from play, and because we have the critical, we have to roll for our ammo check. So we roll our ammo check, and we come up with a blank, which would typically mean that our weapon is out of ammo. However, because his carbine has the reliable special rule, we can re-roll the ammo check. And on the re-roll, we're able to roll a shield, so we still have ammo to make our second shot. And now we can make our second shot at the other walker who was in the kill zone of our original target. So on our second shot, Wes is able to roll four successes with two criticals, and the walker rolls in defense two successes and one critical. Now the walker's first critical will cancel out one of Wes's, and the two successes will cancel out two of Wes's. However, because he rolled the additional two successes and the critical, he's going to wind up removing this walker as well. But he's going to be out of ammo because he rolled the double criticals, which automatically cause an out of ammo result. So all in all, that's not bad for one action with Wes. He's able to make two shots, successfully remove two walkers, and don't forget, we put that ammo reload token on him because his weapon is now out of ammo until he's able to reload it. So most weapons, when fired in Call to Arms, are going to cause mayhem. Now what mayhem does is it's going to attract any walker within 10 inches of the source of the mayhem to the source. And the walkers are going to respond by moving in a direct line 6 inches unless they come into contact with an object. So if you have them, you can use the measuring sticks that came with the All At War core game or the Prelude to Woodbury starter sets, or you can just use a tape measure. What you're going to do is measure 10 inches away from the source of the noise, which in this case is Wes, and then any walker that falls within that 10 inches is going to move 6 inches towards Wes, because he's the, he's the source of the noise. So we're going to have the walker in front of the building over here is within 10 inches. There's a walker back here between the police cars. However, he's outside of the 10 inches, so he's not going to move. If he was closer, he would move, and then as soon as he made contact with the police car, he would then stop. One of the important things to remember, and it's very often asked, with multiple shots, you only calculate for the mayhem at the end of the shooting action. So it doesn't matter if you fire just one shot, or two, or three, or however many shots you have that your card says that you can fire, at the end of your last shot, that is when you're going to calculate for the mayhem, only once. Now you will roll 
each time for an ammo check. So if you roll a critical success on your first shot and you come up as out of ammo, even if you re-roll the reliable and you're out of ammo again, you're going to be out of ammo and you can't make any additional shots. So noise and mayhem at the end of the last shot, ammo reloads after every shot. Let's talk about some other actions here. So let's cover the reload action. So if Wes has made a shoot action and he is now out of ammo, which we know because he has the purple token next to him, he can spend one action to reload his weapon. Now all we have to do is say that we're going to reload our weapon. We don't need any special equipment, items, bullet cards, anything like that. We just need to say that we're going to spend one action to reload our weapon, and that's what we're going to do. So we've done that, we've declared a reload, we've removed our token, and that has spent one action. Now another action we can take would be to scavenge. So what this means is that you're going to collect a supply counter from a point in the game. Now you can see here that we're not in contact with the supply counter, but we're in contact with the police car. So here we're going to say that that bag of guns is inside of the car. Because I'm touching the car, I can then scavenge the gun bag out of it. Now this is going to take one action. All we have to do is be in contact with either the piece of terrain that the object is inside of, or the object itself if it's just sitting flat on the board. The supply counter that we're taking cannot be contested, which in this case would mean if that walker was in contact with the police car, like this, then we can't take that until that walker is either eliminated or pulled off of the car by a noise action or something else that would take him off of it. Once we collect the supply token, we'll take it and drop it in the supply area of our character card. Now, not that this should happen in a game, but in the event that there are multiple supply counters in one area, like say this police car has three on it, Gabe can only ever pick up one supply counter per turn. Regardless of how many actions he has, you can only pick up one supply counter at a time. If Gabe has picked up the bag of guns and we have it on his character card, and at some point during the game at a later time, Gabe is then eliminated, that supply counter is now lost. It's not dropped where it can be picked up by someone else or anything like that. It's thought that when Gabe goes down, whatever he was carrying is then trampled into the mud or it's broken beyond repair. Whatever supply counter he has is lost. So if we start the game with five supply counters, Gabe has one, we're now only fighting over four supply counters for the rest of the game. So let's say Carl was engaged by this walker due to the noise created by someone else and he's yet to activate yet. One of the things Carl can try and do is to shove this walker out of contact with him. What he's going to do is roll the 50-50 die, and on a badge, he's going to spend one action to shove that walker one inch away from him. Now if he rolls a blank, then that walker is going to stay in contact with him. Now this shove action will work with up to four walkers being engaged with you. If you're engaged by more than four, which in call to arms would be a herd, you cannot attempt to make a shove action. If he successfully rolls the badge, then in some massive feat of strength or roundhouse kick or whatever he does, Carl is going to shove each of those walkers back one inch and then still have a second action to take. Some items in the game may be locked and you have to break or smash your way into them. So this action is going to be called a smash. Now what's going to happen is in the scenario outline for the game, it will assign a defense value to the object that you need to smash open. So in this instance, we need to open up these trailer doors because they're locked shut. So in the scenario, it's going to say, open the trailer doors. The trailer doors have a defense value of one white die. So at that point, when your survivor comes in contact with it, you would roll a white die and whatever comes up on it is the defense value for that item. So here we roll a two. And we know that the trailer doors, you have to roll greater than a 2 to break your way into them. So the way you break your way into them is using your melee skill combat. So we'll look at Eugene's character card. So we look at Eugene's character card and his melee stat, and he has a white and a red 
as a base melee skill. When rolling your smash attack, the only way you add any kind of additional dice to that would be if you have a weapon that has the bludgeon keyword. So if his baseball bat were to have the bludgeon keyword, we would add an additional red to the melee attack on the doors. But because we don't, we're only going to be rolling our base attack. So Eugene rolls his base attack of his red and white, gets three successes, which is enough then to smash open the doors of the trailer. Smash is always going to create noise. If Eugene were to roll a two or less on his smash attempt, he would just be banging his bat against the doors and it's not going to open. It's still, however, going to create noise and draw a net walker towards him. Sometimes hiding may be one of the best options for you to take. So one of the actions that you can take in Call to Arms is to simply hide. Now to hide, you have to be unengaged and in contact with a piece of scenery. Now the scenery also has to be unengaged by any other enemies. So there can be no walkers or no enemies in contact with that piece of scenery. And what you're going to do is just say, Gloria is going to use one action, Gloria is going to hide. And then you can either lay the model prone, or you can just take a marker and put a marker next to her to let them know that she is now prone. Now prone models can still be shot at as normal, and they can still defend against it. However, if Gloria is behind the piece of scenery when she elects to use her hide action, and Carl is on the other side, and he plans to take a shot at her, Gloria is now prone and behind that piece of scenery. And prone models behind scenery cannot be targeted by ranged combat. So Carl can then not take a shot at her unless he moves to get around it or there's another model someplace else. But this will cancel out Carl's shot against her if that was his intent. Now sticking with Gloria, we can't play the entire game on the ground. So to get up from being prone, we're going to use one action to then stand up. So we take an action, we say we're going to stand up, and we just remove the prone marker or stand the model back up if we laid it down the first time. So as an action in Call to Arms, one of the things you can do is to make noise. Now make noise is used pretty strategically, and that is going to be to draw the attention of walkers or herds of walkers to be moved in a direction. So here we have Gloria, who is most likely going to be engaged by this walker at a later point in the game. And then we have Eugene a little bit further away. Now Eugene is much more suited to take on that walker than Gloria would be. Or we may have plans to have Gloria go and do something else and we don't want her to be engaged. So we can have Eugene, during his activation, spend one action to make noise. Now this could be him screaming, yelling, jumping, banging his bat on the ground, whatever it takes to create some kind of distraction to get that walker to turn around and come at him instead of going towards Gloria. So what we would do is then take our measuring stick or measuring tape, if we don't have the stick, and we're going to take the closest walker within 10 inches of the source of the noise, which in this case is Eugene, and that walker is then going to move in a direct line six inches towards the source of the noise. So we now have that walker engaging Eugene, and Gloria is going to be free to take whatever actions she wants to in her turn. Okay, this action is going to be very similar to the shove action that we covered earlier. This is going to be a withdraw action. So here again, we're going to have Gloria, and Gloria is engaged this time by Rick. Now what she can choose to do is to withdraw. She's going to use two of her actions, and that is going to allow her to withdraw from this combat. Now, the difference between this and a shove is that unlike shove, which you can only do against walkers, you can do this against survivors. If you choose to withdraw from a survivor, that survivor that you're running away from is going to get some kind of sucker punch in before you go. So what we'll do is we'll still roll for an attack that Gloria can defend against, but it will allow her to free herself from this combat. So here Gloria has elected to withdraw from Rick. Rick is going to roll his attack value for melee combat, which is a white base, plus a white for his hatchet. So he rolls three successes. And then Gloria is going to roll her defense, which is a single blue. So she rolls a two. We subtract the two differences. And Gloria is going to take one wound, but she can now move up to a full run distance away from Rick. 
so then Gloria has moved four inches away from Rick. So essentially, it uses two actions, but you're getting a move action out of it. If Gloria wanted to use her withdrawal against a walker, you don't have to roll any kind of attack. It's only against the survivor that you have to roll to get out of there. So here, Gloria can use her two actions to withdraw from the walker and then move up to eight inches if she wants to. So Gloria has used her two actions, she's withdrawn from the walker, and moved back four inches. Okay, so if you remember back from our first and second videos, the first video we used our facts to build our team, which we've gone through some actions in this video, and we've seen how to use those actions. And then in the second video, we rolled for our strategy points. Now, we have three strategy points that we can use during most of the actions that we just covered. Now, when we get to use the strategy points, it's typically after we make that action or right before we make that action. It doesn't take an action to use the strategy points. Now, the card on the left covers the different character types for each of the ones that we have on our team. And it talks about how we can apply the strategy points to add extra dice normally to our actions. So if we look at the second ability, which says crack shot, it's for marksmen only. Now, back from the first video, we know that Lily is a marksman. And from this video, Lily took a couple shooting actions. So that card says that any marksman that performs a range attack may spend one strategy point to reroll blanks in the range attack roll. So what we do is activate Lily, make her shooting action, and then roll for it. If we roll a blank, we can say that we want to use the crack shot ability to reroll one of the blanks. So we'll cash in one of our strategy points and then reroll the die. Each survivor can only do one strategy per round. So Lily can't cash in all three strategy points using this crack shot ability. And then if you look at the card on the right, these are going to be our faction specific special rules. So remember back from our very first video where we built our team using the facts, anyone that has the, the governor's face down in their faction area can benefit from this. Or anyone that has no specific faction icon down there is now part of our primary faction and can benefit from this as well. So the conscript militia special rule at the top says that models with the Woodbury Commander keyword and friendly models within three inches of them can spend one strategy point and add red to their ranged attack roll. Now I don't think that we'd have to worry about it with anyone in this team, but you're going to have to remember the rule of three. And what that says is you cannot roll more than three dice of the same color at any time. So if you have someone that has a, a red shooting ability and then they have a weapon that gives them two additional red dice, they're already rolling their maximum of three red dice. So it wouldn't make sense to spend a strategy point to give them that extra red die on top of their ranged attack because you can't roll the fourth red die. So you're going to want to try and use these strategically, which is why they are strategy points. Alright, so now that we've covered all the other actions in the game, we've gone over moving, shooting, fighting in melee combat, scavenging supplies, a whole ton of different things, we can talk about some special actions that you can take. Now these are going to be listed somewhere down on your card. We're going to look at the governor because we haven't activated him yet, and under his special rules, you can see he has something called kill em all. Now this is a special order, which is going to take an action, and it also says that we're going to spend one strategy point to create noise. And then every other friendly Woodbury army model within six inches of him is going to add a red die to their attack roll, whether it be melee or ranged, for the remainder of this round. All right, so then down here with the governor, we've used that special action, and we're going to create noise. So remember, with noise, it's going to move the single closest walker within 10 inches, 6 inches, closer to the source of the noise in a direct line. So we're going to take the walker in the green shirt, move him 6 inches closer to the governor. And then the second part of that said, we're going to add an additional red die to any friendly Woodbury Army model within 6 inches of the governor which is going to be the governor himself and Gloria. So now the governor has used one action to complete the special action of kill them all, 
which gave him and Lily a bonus die. And now he has one action left to carry out whatever else he wants to do. You're going to want to try and time out the special actions to that is going to be most beneficial to not only the character doing it, but anyone else around them that it's going to help as well. All right, guys. So hopefully this video was really helpful to you in learning the, the basics of the actions for Call to Arms. If you've played All Out War, most of it is fairly similar with a couple different uh, tweaks here and there. But if you're new to the game, I hope this was really helpful to you. Now, some of the things have a couple more advanced ways that you can apply them, um, but I really wanted to just get the basics out there for now. We can come back and revisit those. If you'd like to, just let me know in the comments below. Please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Let me know what else you'd like to see. I'm looking forward to some of the stuff that Mantic has coming up in the next couple months for Call to Arms with new releases that they've been talking about, which should make it great. I'll try to get as many videos as I can out there. I really want to do a versus video with the, the Woodbury Army, and then I want to do a full Woodbury Army video to see how many points all of the Woodbury models are that are out right now, because there are a ton of them. Hope you guys like this. Sorry it took so long to get this one out there to you. It was a lot to film and a whole bunch to edit, but I hope it's really helpful to you guys.